The goal of a vaccine is to do one of two things. One is to prevent an infection. The second is to make an infection less severe if you get infected with that virus or, or organism. So that's the goal. The way it achieves that is by creating a immune response that's specific for the virus or whatever it is you're vaccinating against. And there are two kinds of immune responses that we're interested in. The first kind is called antibodies. Antibodies are soluble and are present in plasma, and their job is to bind to the virus and neutralize it so it can't infect a cell. The second kind of immune response we're interested in is called a T-cell response. And T-cells are those uh, cells of the immune system which kill cells we don't want. So the goal of a T-cell in the context of an infection is to kill those cells which are infected and those infected cells essentially become virus factories. And so if you kill the virus factory, you make fewer viruses and hopefully you'll become less sick. Typically what we'll do is controlled clinical trials of a number of people get the vaccine, a number of people don't get the vaccine. And the hope is that those who get the vaccine get infected less frequently and when they are infected, they get less sick. On the other side, the safety side, there are a variety of side effects that are associated with any medicine or any therapy, some of which we can predict and some of which we can't predict. And so it's important to have controlled observation of people who get the vaccine to see whether or not there are side effects that are unintended. Monitoring long-term side effects of any therapy is critical. After a product is approved by the FDA and sold as a product, then they go into this thing called post-marketing surveillance. But we're so far away from that occurring that right now we need to do careful controlled observational studies of what the side effects are. Now it's important to realize side effects can be good or they can be bad. We've talked about some of the bad side effects that, that these vaccines can make you worse um, if you get infected. Some of these vaccines can do unintended things. Um, they can cause inflammation or autoimmunity all very rare but possible. I think we need to take a very careful and considered approach to, to distribution of the vaccine or vaccines. It's important to note that um, even if we have one vaccine that works, that's probably not enough to, to cover the entire human population. So it's probable we'll have multiple different vaccines approved if they prove effective. Um, so what will be the logistics of it? I don't know what the right answer is. Um, but I think the characteristics of the right answer include there should be a centralized uh, uh, rationing of this. It should be coordinated and thoughtful. And it should not be those who offer to buy it first, get it first. To the credit of Mayo leadership, they put together the SARS-CoV-2 COVID Research Task Force uh, and empowered it to oversee the totality of COVID-related research at Mayo. Between then and now, we've developed 17 work streams that cover everything you can imagine in COVID research. So that includes studies on the virus itself, studies on the immunology, studies on the vaccine, inpatient treatments, outpatient treatments, databases, biobanks, a process for, for triaging the biobanks, who gets what specimens and why, artificial intelligence analytics of, of, the, of the medical record and the data that's coming out. A lot of effort's gone into understanding why different populations are differentially affected by this pandemic. And that includes both on the biologic basis and the societal basis. And so we spent a lot of time translating protocols and providing information in multiple different languages. We have work streams that work on environmental decontamination, so how you clean surfaces so that SARS doesn't stay around. Um, so Mayo's really done a lot of work and it's been uh, truly remarkable how experts from almost every domain have stepped up and contributed to the research portfolio surrounding SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. We know when you have influenza, you can be more susceptible to other infections. So it is probable that if you have influenza, you can be more susceptible to COVID. A second is every human has a certain physiologic reserve, which means that we can stand up with a certain degree of insult, but if we go beyond that, then it's gonna be difficult for us to recover. 
And so if you consider the additive effects of influenza and SARS-CoV-2, that could be devastating. So I think it's in everybody's interest to try to prevent acquisition of flu in this upcoming season.